Recently, a few weeks ago, the body of Christ had a little bit of a shakeup when a renowned Christian worship music artist renounced his faith on social media. How many are familiar with that? Kind of went viral. Uh, it sparked a lot of conversation about how people perceive the ministry that he worked for and how people can continue to receive from that ministry in the future. Uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, you know, people, as a pastor, people often come up to me and they'll say, you know, Pastor Heath, what do you think about this ministry or what do you think about that ministry? What do you think about this preacher or that, that preacher, this minister, this author, uh, whoever? Firstly, it doesn't matter what I think, amen, because I'm a, I'm a fallible human being. I, I have right opinions and I have wrong opinions. I'm not arrogant enough to presume that I know it all. And you shouldn't be either. Amen. Amen. Uh, I believe we should always be wary of ministers who precede their statements with, I believe, because it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the Word of God says. Amen. I mean, on it, obviously we're supposed to believe the Word of God. But uh, I don't want to hear somebody's opinion. I want to know what the Word of God says. Uh, several years ago, I was sitting in on a youth group meeting, and they were having a Q&A session, and uh, the kids were asking questions, and the youth leader was, was answering them. And every single question that they asked, the youth leader started their answer with, I believe. I believe this. I believe that. Well, I think it's good that people know what their leader believes, but it's more important to know what the Word of God says, okay? But I totally understand that as, as a preacher, as a, as a pastor, people want to know what I think about certain ministries because it says a lot about what I believe because if you follow a certain minister, you're probably going to believe what they believe. You follow what I'm saying? So, you know, how do we... How do we look at different ministries and how do we view different ministries? Um, the, the title of my message tonight is Chew Up the Meat and Spit Out the Bones. Okay? That's, you were wondering why we had a picture of barbecue up there. <clears throat> Chew up the meat and spit out the bones. And I believe that's what we need to do with every ministry that we ever see. We need to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, and I'm reading this in the Amplified Version. It says this, Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. We could stop right there and just preach on that for a whole evening. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench, do not subdue, do not be unresponsive to the working and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if the Holy Spirit is moving in a certain way, we need to be responding to it. We need to be receptive to it. We need to be open to it. We need not snuff it out. Don't quench the working of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, do not scorn or reject gifts of prophecy or prophecies spoken revelation, words of instruction or exhortation or warning. I think the King James says, do not despise prophesyings. In other words, we need to make room for the prophetic word of the Holy Spirit to move in our personal lives and in our church. Just a moment ago, my wife was moved by the Holy Spirit to pray for people and uh, pray for different situations. And then as she was doing that, the Holy Spirit moved upon me to have people come down to the altar and stand in the gap for people. We need to be open to the flowing and the ministry of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Louise and I didn't plan that. That was just something that happened as the Holy Spirit was speaking to her and as the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. So do not quench the Spirit. Do not scorn or reject prophecy. Verse 21, and here's what I really want to focus on tonight. But test all things carefully so that you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly. Everyone say firmly. firmly. Hold firmly to that which is good. So 
Test all things carefully and hold firmly to that which is good. Why does it say to hold to that which is good? Because when you're testing all things, you are going to find some things that are not good. Every single time. In every ministry, in every church, in every pastor, in every speaker, every evangelist, every author, no ministry is 100% completely without error. Because every single one of us are fallible people. We serve a perfect God, but we're not perfect people. There is no ministry that has 100% infallible theology. There is no ministry that hasn't missed God at one point or another in their life. That's why we all need grace. Right. Amen? Now, Sherry's not here tonight, so you're all going to have to make a little more noise. <laughs> okay. Notice it says, hold firmly to that which is good. It does not say, hold, f hold firmly to they who are good. Right. Romans chapter 3 tells us that there is none who are righteous, no, not one. That's right. <laughs> so it actually emphasizes it. There's none who are righteous, no, not one. He, he didn't leave it alone just to say there's none who are righteous. He gave it a little emphasis. And then he said it again a few verses later in the same chapter. Romans chapter 3, if you read it just by itself, it's a pretty depressing chapter. Because <laughs> that, same, that, same that same chapter of scripture, it says, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short at one point or another. When you're testing things, you're going to find things that aren't good. But when you do find something that is good, you need to hold firmly to it. If we were to hold firmly to they who are good, we wouldn't be holding firmly to anyone. <laughs> because there is none that are good. We need to hold firmly to that which is good. In other words, we need to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. Good. When you see something that you disagree with in a ministry, there is nothing in that verse that says, shout out the error from the hilltops and expose the error and the false doctrines in every ministry that you come across. Amen. It doesn't say that, does it? However, the Bible does say that love covers the multitude of sin. So if we, if we love our brother, if we love our sister, if we love people, then we need to cover the multitude of sin, not expose it. Well, Pastor Heath, don't we have the responsibility of exposing lies? No, we don't. There you go. We have the responsibility of exposing truth. Yep. You don't have the responsibility of exposing lies. You have the, the responsibility of exposing the truth of the word of God. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19 says this. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. If you want to eliminate lies, stop perpetuating them. Stop talking about them. Stop bringing attention to them. Just let them die. The truth endures forever, but the lie lasts for only a moment. The lie lasts for only a, a, a season. Truth endures forever, but the lie quickly dies because a lie cannot sustain itself. If you're taking notes, you should write that down. A lie can't sustain itself. A lie lasts for just a moment. Stop talking about it. It'll go away. Uh, about... Ten years ago or so, Morgan Freeman uh, had an interview with Mike Wallace. And uh, Mike Wallace, uh, he was talking with Morgan Freeman about racism. And he said uh, to Morgan Freeman, he asked him a question about uh, Black History Month. And Morgan Freeman said, I don't want a Black History Month. And he says, do you want, uh, uh, Mike Wallace is Jewish, he says, do you want a Jewish History Month? And Mike Wallace said, no. And then Mike Wallace said this. He goes, well, how are we going to combat racism? And Morgan Freeman said some of the wisest words I've ever heard. He said, stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. It'll go away. Stop bringing attention to it. And it'll, the, the lie only endures for a moment. 
If we would stop bringing attention to it, the lie would go away. The truth is what endures. Amen? If people would just shut up about it, it would go away. But people keep talking about it, so it lives on. Remember, the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. The power is in your tongue. You should, you should look at your tongue. Your tongue is like a battery. Your tongue is a power source. There is no power in death, and there is no power in life. The power is in the tongue. The tongue has the ability to energize death or energize life. The tongue also has the ability to energize truth or energize a lie. So stop talking about the lie and the lie will die off. Amen? There are ministries out there who spend the majority of their time exposing false doctrine or what they consider to be false doctrine. They spend the majority of their airtime, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, basically sowing discord in the body of Christ, all in the name of exposing lies. They talk about it on the radio, they talk about it on television, social media, they write books about it. They spend all of their time and energy telling people what not to believe, instead of just telling people what the truth of the word of God is. Again, our responsibility is not to expose lies, it's, it's to expose truth. Just, just tell people what to believe, and they will know what not to believe. Tell people what the truth is, and they'll be able to recognize false doctrine. Amen? You say, well, what, what ministries are those that, uh, ex that do that kind of thing? I'm not telling you. I'd be just as bad as they are. Back to verse 21 of First Thessalonians 5. Test all things carefully so that you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to that which is good. How are we supposed to hold on to it? Firmly. Firmly. Strongly. In other words, receive it readily. Hold on to it. Grab on to it. Use it. Benefit from it. Let it feed you. Grow from it. Further the kingdom with it. Burn away the chaff and eat the wheat. Chew up the meat. Spit out the bones. It doesn't matter who said it. It doesn't matter why they said it. It doesn't matter what motives they had when they said it. If it's truth, it's truth. And the truth will set you free. It doesn't matter if somebody said something with the wrong motive. If they spoke the truth, hang on to it. Hold firmly to it. Let it feed you. Let it benefit you. No one has a full grasp on anything. In fact, uh, that same passage in uh, Romans chapter 3 where it says, uh, uh, it says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And it says, there's, no, there's none righteous, no, not one. And in that same passage, it also says, there is none who have full understanding. And we need to realize that nobody has full understanding. I think so many times we put ministers up on a pedestal because we think they're totally infallible. And then when they, when they end up uh, uh, falling for whatever reason, then it affects our faith because we put our faith in a person rather than putting our faith in God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, when I came to your church, I didn't come to you in my own abilities to impress you. I came to you in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit because I didn't want you putting your faith in me. I wanted you putting your faith to put your faith in, uh, in the power of God. No one has a full grasp on, every, on anything, but everyone has something that they can offer that I can benefit from. Everyone does. Something that the kingdom can benefit from. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. Amen? Now, too many Christians are not that gracious. They see one error in someone's doctrine and one thing in that ministry that they don't agree with, and then they totally dismiss that ministry altogether. We need to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. <laughs> Amen? If you can't get past an error that a certain minister committed to the point that you can't receive anything good that comes from that ministry, you may want to reevaluate your own pride. Okay? That ministry may not be perfect, but neither are any of us. So what right do we have to hold their error against them? Amen? 
Jesus said, don't point out the speck that's in your brother's eye when you've got a beam in your own eye. So I'm aware of the controversy surrounding this young worship artist who just renounced his faith. That doesn't mean that I'm going to stop doing the worship songs that he wrote. I can still chew up the meat and spit out the bones. There is something that he created that benefited the kingdom. And even though he's going through a dark period in his life right now, I'm not going to throw out everything that he ever did just because he made a mistake. Just because he's going through a, a, a bad season in his life right now. I'm not walking in his shoes. I don't know what he's experiencing. I don't know why he renounced his faith in front of the whole world. Maybe instead of boycotting the good that he did, maybe I should just pray for my brother. A few years ago, I was uh, uh, flying to Iowa to do a funeral. And I was sitting on the airplane next to this lady. And she says, what do you do for a living? And uh, I said, well, I'm a worship pastor. And she goes, oh, um, whose music do you do? And I listened to a couple of different artists. And she goes, do you do any music from Bethel Church? And I said, well, yeah. She goes, are you aware of the controversy with Bethel Church? And at the time, I wasn't. And actually, after the plane landed, I got on the Internet and I started Googling Bethel Church controversy. And at the time, I guess this controversy was fairly young because I couldn't find anything on the Internet about it. And then somebody wrote a book not too long after that, and they talked about a bunch of her heresy that was going on at that church. And, uh, and here, here, here's the thing about that whole situation. I've never been to that church. I've never experienced anything that they've talked about in this book that was written about them. I didn't experience it. I didn't witness it. I can't base my faith on hearsay. Okay? They may or may not be doing some things that are weird and unbiblical and unscriptural. I can't speak to that because I never saw it. But what I can say is, even though they're doing some things or possibly doing some things that they shouldn't be doing, I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some really anointed, powerful Christian worship songs that have come out of that ministry. I'm not going to stop singing it as well just because some kooky people may or may not be doing some weird things. Are you following me? Yes. All right. I don't judge a song based on the songwriter. I judge a song based on the merits of the song. Sometimes I forget who the writer is altogether. A few years ago, I was driving in my car, and this song popped in my head. And I'm kind of, you know, just singing it to myself and everything, going down the road. And I'm like, man, that's a pretty good song. We haven't done that song in a long time, probably a couple of years. It's got a nice little groove to it. I'm like, who wrote that? Oh, yeah, I did. And, I mean, literally, it was like five or ten seconds. I forgot that I wrote the song that was in my head. I don't judge a song based on the writer. I judge a song based on the merits of the song. Christians need to show a little more grace to each other. Amen? As long as we are born again, we are all the body of Christ. We're all imperfect, too. We all have... We, uh, Paul said, we know in part. We prophesy in part. None of us have a full grasp on this whole thing. Now, we serve a perfect God... And when God looks at us, he doesn't see our imperfection. He sees the blood of Jesus. So thank God for that. But that's how God looks at us. When you and I look at each other, we, we see each other's imperfection. <laughs> Amen? We need to give each other some grace. All right? There are some Christians who would never be comfortable worship, worshiping at our church. That's why there are different kinds of churches. With different styles, different personalities, different emphasis on their beliefs. Not better, not worse, just different. So make room in your life for those differences. Make room in your pride for those differences. <laughs> if you're taking notes, you can write this down. If Christians treated the writers of the Bible the same way we treat most ministries, we'd throw out half of God's word. 
The largest book of the Bible was written by an adulterous murderer. The book of Psalms was written by David. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He had a man put to death so that he could sleep with his wife. Now, think about that. He wrote the largest book of the Bible. There's 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. Now, how many ministers do we know of that are adulterous murderers who anybody would pay any attention to? And half of the New Testament was written by a man who persecuted Christians and sent them to their deaths. Yet we give, we, 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 we give him room to speak into our lives. Amen? One of the most popular televangelists ever was a man named Jimmy Swaggart. How many ever watched Jimmy Swaggart? When, or still watch him? He's still on television. Everyone saw his ministry rise to unprecedented levels of influence in the 1980s. I mean, there was nobody bigger than him at, at his height. And then we saw his ministry fall. And today his ministry is just a shell of what it used to be when it was in its heyday. Now, I catch him on TV every once in a while, and i got to be honest with you. There are some things that he says that I wholeheartedly disagree with. There's statements that I've heard him make on television that I'm like, nah, just, I can't get on board with that. There's a lot of law in some of the things that he says, okay? Despite the things that I disagree with, despite the fall that he had, despite the sin that he fell into, I cannot argue with the fact that my dad is born again today because of Jimmy Swaggart's ministry. And that's all of it right there. Amen. Amen? If my dad had not gotten saved, it's possible this church wouldn't exist. It's possible that I never would have gone into the ministry. My dad got saved. When he got saved, our whole family started going to church. We started going to a small, non-denominational Pentecostal church. I was filled with the Holy Ghost in that church. I received the call of God during the time that I attended that church. If my dad never got saved, it's possible that we never would have gone to church as a family. I may have drifted from the Lord. I mean, I got saved when I was 10 years old. But if we weren't going to church through my teenage years, I might have drifted from the Lord. I may never have received the Holy Ghost. I may never have made the determination to follow God in my calling. So in a sense, Faith Life Worship Center owes its existence to a man who committed multiple acts of adultery in the 1980s. <laughs> so chew on that for a minute. <laughs> right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Everyone say soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. Say that. Joints and marrow. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, soul and spirit. It's not as easy to divide soul and spirit as it is to divide spirit and flesh. Okay? The Bible says that the flesh and the spirit are at war with each other. The flesh doesn't want what the spirit wants. The spirit doesn't want what the flesh wants. Galatians chapter 5 says this, verse 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now, flesh and spirit, they're really easy to divide, because they want opposite things. But... Hebrews chapter 4 doesn't say that the word of God divides flesh and spirit. It says it divides soul and spirit. That's a little bit more difficult. Sometimes your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, sometimes your mind, your will, and your emotions want what your spirit wants. Because you've renewed your mind to the word of God. Sometimes your mind, your will, and your emotions are in league with what your flesh wants. It's a little harder to divide soul and spirit. It's also hard to divide joints and marrow. But the Bible says that the word of God is sharp enough to do so. 
It's sharp enough to divide soul and spirit. It's sharp enough to divide bones and marrow. So if the word of God is sharp enough to divide soul and spirit, if the word of God is sharp enough to divide joints and marrow, surely the word of God in you is sharp enough to divide the meat from the bones. Amen. Amen? It's sharp enough to divide what you can consume with what you shouldn't consume. So test all things, hold firmly to that which is good. Let it nourish you, let it prosper you, let it further the kingdom that's on the inside of you, let it bless you, hold on to it, grab on to it, hold firmly to it, don't let go of it. In other words, chew up the meat, spit out the bones. Spit out the bones. That's all I wanted to share with you tonight. Amen. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Heath Jarvis from Faith Life Worship Center, and I hope that you really enjoyed the message that you just saw. And if you like this message, check out our other videos, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com where you can learn all about our church, our service times, and everything that's going on, and we would love to see you really soon at Faith Life Worship Center.